Hey Ramblers, this video covers chapter 4.1 in our textbook and deals with using first and second derivatives. Now all through chapter 3, what we've been doing for the last six weeks or so, has been finding formulas and shortcuts for derivatives, but now we're actually going to apply the information that we can gain from a derivative. So first we're going to define some terms. We're going to need to know what increasing functions are and decreasing functions. We're going to need to know what critical points are and local maximum and local minimums. But then we're going to also want to look at um, a little bit of a warning sign that we're going to need to pay attention to when we're searching for critical points. All right, the last thing we're going to talk about are sign patterns and what's called the first derivative test. That's not going to finish the entire section, but that's all we're going to do for this video because there's a lot of information in this first section that we're going to be using throughout the year. So please, please, please pause often take really careful notes on this video and once again thanks for watching. Okay as we get started here let's remind ourselves of some definitions that we already know. You'll remember what an increasing function is. f of x is increasing then the derivative f prime of x is greater than zero. The opposite is true for decreasing. If f of x is decreasing then f prime of x is less than zero or it's negative. And it's worth mentioning that if f prime of x equals 0, then the function is neither increasing nor decreasing. Okay, so these are some pretty important functions. So make sure that you have, I'm sorry, pretty important definitions. So make sure you have increasing function and decreasing function in your notes. And also be aware that if f prime of x equals 0, then we have neither situation going on. Okay, let's take this and apply it to a function. And let's use these facts to analyze um, a cubic. Let's take the function y equals x cubed minus 9x squared minus 48x plus 52. What does it look like? Well, without a calculator, you probably can't get much further than knowing that it's a little more exciting than a regular cubic. Now the parent function for a cubic is shown here. This is y equals x cubed. And all these extra terms, the quadratic term and the linear term and the constant, are going to make it a little more interesting. But without a calculator, we probably couldn't say what exactly it's going to look like. So that's where calculus comes in. So let's start using some of the tools we have at our disposal. The first will be using the first derivative. In order to analyze this, let's find what the first derivative is. Well, y prime will equal 3x squared minus 18x minus 48. Now, earlier in this video, we saw that if we can determine the sign of the first derivative, we can determine where it's increasing, decreasing, and where it's neither. So where it might have a maximum or a minimum. So our first job is going to be to analyze the first derivative and find out where the function is increasing by determining where the first derivative is positive, where the function is decreasing by determining where the first derivative is negative, and determining where the function is doing neither. So where is the derivative equal to zero? All right, well this one here that's going to be our first step. We're going to set the first derivative equal to 0, and we're going to solve for x. So for this problem, we're going back to algebra 2 here, I'm going to divide through by 3. So 0 equals x squared minus 6x minus 16. Now luckily to solve this, I can just factor. And I'm going to recognize that the factors of 16 that have a difference of 6 are 8 and 2. So this will factor to be x minus 8 x plus 2. So therefore x equals 8 or negative 2. These two points we've just found by setting the first derivative equal to 0 and solving for x are called critical points. 
critical points are very important in our analysis of the graph. So let's define them. Pause the video and, and read through this definition. Maybe put it in your notes. But what, let's definitely go through it together. For any function, a point in the domain where the derivative f prime of p is either zero or undefined is called a critical point. So that's the first thing. This critical point, we'll call it p, is also is the x value. The y value, f of p, is known as the critical value. Now, just to make things more confusing, the point p comma f of p is also known as a critical point. This is just vocabulary, but it's really important vocabulary. It's super important that you know that critical points are where the first derivative equals zero or the first derivative does not exist. All right, let's talk about how we're going to use them. Okay, in order to use the critical points, we're going to make what's known as a sign pattern. Now, a sign pattern is really just a number line where we're going to kind of organize our information that we gain from the derivatives. So we make a long number line, so we're not cramped, and that's just the x-axis. Below the axis will be the behavior of the derivative f prime of x, and above the number line will be the behavior of the original function f of x. So in this case, we found that our critical points where x equals 8 and x equals negative 2. We're going to mark those on the number line because those are important points. And by our analysis, those were the only places where x had a critical point. Those are the only places that the derivative was 0 or where the derivative was undefined. All right, so what do we do with this? Well, it's called a sign pattern because we're interested in the sign of the derivative. So you'll recall that our derivative was 3x squared minus 18x minus 48. Now I'm interested in knowing what is the sign when x is less than negative 2. Well, I'm going to plug in a number that's less than negative 2. Now let's be smart. Let's put a big number or a, a, a large negative number. So I'll put in negative 100. So f prime of negative 100 is going to equal 3 times negative 100 squared, which is going to be a gigantic positive number because of that squaring, minus 18 times negative 100 minus 48. Now again, I don't need a calculator. I can tell that this first term is going to be positive because I'm squaring a negative. And the two negatives in the second term are going to make that positive. So subtracting this 48 is not going to be nearly enough to keep this first um, region of our number line positive. And as we learned in the first semester, when the first derivative is positive, the original function is increasing. Now, we know that the second derivative, I'm sorry, we know that at negative 2, the derivative equals 0. So that means that the function's not increasing or decreasing there. So let's look at what's going on between negative 2 and 8. I'm going to plug in an easy number to work with between negative 2 and 8. How about 0? So that's a pretty easy one to figure out. f of 0 is going to equal negative 48. Since the first derivative is negative, my original function must be decreasing. Now, at 8, once again, we solved and found that the derivative was 0 there. So we're going to look at points that are to the right of 8. So let's plug in f of positive 100. And when we do that, we're going to get a similar result to when we plugged in negative 100. We'll have 3 times 100 squared, which is going to be giant, minus 18 times 100, which is a pretty big number, but nowhere near as large as this 100 squared. And then we'll be subtracting 48. 
All told, this first term is going to dominate everything, and I'm pretty sure without using a calculator that my derivative to the right side of 8 is going to be positive. So that means that my function is increasing again. Okay, so just to review, doing my analysis, I found my two critical points, x equals 8 and x equals negative 2. Then I set up my sign pattern to find out where is the original function increasing and decreasing. I did that by determining the sign of the first derivative. Once I knew that, I was able to figure out whether the original function is increasing or decreasing. Now, let's, um, let's get a couple other values and we'll finish up our sketch here. Okay, once we found our critical points, we plug them back into the original equation to get the critical values. The critical values are just the y values that correspond to the x values, which are critical points. When we plug in, we get that our critical values are 104, occurring at, the cr at negative 2, and negative 396, which occurs at x equals 8. So the point negative 2 comma 104 is also known as a critical point. I know that's confusing because just the x portion we've called a critical point, but the actual coordinate is also known as a critical point. Okay, so what do we do with this? Well, we go back to um, our, you know, looking at a graph and using some of the tricks that we learned last year in pre-calc. For instance, I know that I'm going to have a y-intercept of 52 because in the original equation, if I plug 0 in for x, I'd get 52. I've now learned that I have a critical point at negative 2, comma, 104. And the scale's a little off, but I know that I have another critical point at 8, comma, negative 190, I'm sorry, negative 396. That should be negative. From my analysis of the first derivative, I know I'm increasing all the way until negative 2. Then I decrease through my y-intercept until I hit the minimum there at 8, negative 396. And then my derivative turned positive again, so it increased. So my function is going to look something like that. Now, had you gone to Des Desmos and just tried graphing this, you would have gotten something that looks like this. And honestly, without the help of calculus, you wouldn't have really known where to start looking or where would you be done looking when you got a, a bigger picture. So let's you know, take a look if we zoom out, because certainly the graph that we created is a lot more interesting than this thing that came out of Desmos. And as you can see, because of our calculus, we knew there was more to the graph, and in fact, our sketch is a pretty good estimate of what's going on in, uh, with this curve. So let's review some of the terms that we've learned. Um, again, you know, reviewing maybe some of the techniques as well. And um, recognize that there's going to be more refinement as we start to use the second derivative um, later on. But for now, let's, let's go back over some of what we learned in this video. Okay, you may remember as we analyzed this graph, the first thing we did was that we took the derivative. Um, once we find the derivative, we want to set it equal to zero and find those places where the derivative uh, equals zero. These values where x equal, where the derivative equals zero are your critical points. Now, it's important to remember, critical points are also places where the derivative is undefined. But we'll run into situations like that when we start dealing with a little more complicated functions. All right, now, we also want to talk about um, what happens at these critical points. For instance, in our example, we, we saw that we had two. We had... 2 comma negative, I'm sorry, it was 2, 104. 
and 8, comma, negative 396. Now, 2104 was a local maximum, and 8, negative 396 was a local minimum. And those aren't any more complicated than they appear, but here's the exact definitions. A local minimum occurs at an x value if the y value is less than or equal to the values nearby. Okay, so in other words, if you have a valley, the minimum is the bottom of the trough. A local maximum occurs is the y value that is the top of a hill or the top of a of a point, or you know, top of the mountain kind of thing. Um, it's really very obvious. The local maximum is a y value that is larger than y values in the area. And we're going to meet global maximums and global minimums, but not right now. Um, so this is actually the first derivative test. Um, where we found on our sign pattern, you may recall we plugged in a negative 2 and an 8 because those are the places where the derivative was equal to 0. And we found that the derivative was positive to the left of negative 2, that it was negative between those two values, and positive to the right of 8. That meant that our original function was increasing, decreasing, and then increasing again. This is essentially the first derivative test recognizing that if a, if a function is continuous and a derivative exists, that changing from positive to negative indicates that you have a maximum. And if the derivative changes from negative to positive, it indicates that you have a minimum. And that is what is known as the first derivative test. But let me give it to you officially for your notes. So if f changes from decreasing to increasing, then there's a local minimum. That's going to happen if the derivative is negative and it changes to the derivative being positive. That will be a local minimum. If f changes from increasing to decreasing, then we say there's a maximum there. And that occurs when the derivative changes from positive to negative that gives us a local max. Okay, there's a lot of information in this video. We're going to get some more practice with it tomorrow in class. We'll be finding um, lots of maxes and mins and applying the first derivative test. Um, so, Ramblers, you may have to go back and rewatch some of these uh, video, but before I leave you, let me go back to that warning that I mentioned in the introduction. It's really easy to think that anywhere that the derivative is equal to zero is a max or a min. And that's just not true. We have to be careful. Because when f prime of x equals zero, that just means it's a critical point. But not all critical points are maxes or mins. For instance, when I have the curve y equals x cubed, the first derivative is y prime equals 3x squared. If I set that equal to 0, I can see that x equals 0 is a critical point. And that's good. That's good that I found it. And if we put it through the sign pattern, and I set up behavior of the derivative beneath the uh, x number line and the behavior of the original functions above it and I put my critical point x equals 0 on there. Now let's test for points to the left of 0 if I plug it into the derivative let's plug in negative numbers like negative 5 I'd have 3 times negative 5 squared well that's going to equal a positive 75 so, the first derivative is positive, that indicates that my original function is increasing. Now, if I plug in a positive number, 
to test for points to the right of 0, let's try positive 5. I would have 3 times 5 squared. That's 75 again, which is also positive. So my original, oh, so I'm sorry, the original function is increasing. That means that at 0, it fails the first derivative test. I am not changing from positive to negative. I'm not changing sign at all. So that's the warning. Not all places where the derivative is equal to 0 is there a max or a min. So f prime of x equals 0 or f prime of x does not exist means you have a critical point. Not necessarily a max or min. And it's just really important to keep that in mind. You have to test these using the first derivative test. Okay, Ramblers, thanks for watching, um, and I sure hope this helps.